Okay, I'm Stan Cook. I am a pastor, a husband, a father, a grandfather, a district bishop in our denomination. Uh, we also have a world missions organization in Israel, and we have a small business located in Israel. Uh, years ago, uh, the Tea Party movement began, and T stood for taxed enough already, and I was a part of that movement. I can remember being at Trustful, Alabama, as we began the Tea Party movement there. And as a part of every Alabamian's life and American's life, we know that we're overtaxed, and we know the government overspends, and we know that projects are overbudgeted and overfunded, and it's time to bring common sense, business world mentality back into the political arena and into state government. So my approach to the state auditor's office is that we're taxed enough already, let's find a way to save the taxpayer in Alabama money by using the state auditor's position to keep a watchful eye on the politician, the bureaucratic pirate, and every agency in this state and hold them accountable for the money that they have, the money that they have taxed away from you, the citizen of Alabama. Thank you very much. All right, Andrew, your opening statement. All right, well, the name is Andrew Sorrell, and we do pronounce it Sorrell. Sorrell is a red horse, but my grandfather was a preacher in Detroit, and the Yankees pronounced it Sorrell, and he couldn't get away from it, so we just gave up and uh, pronounced it Sorrell for the last three generations. But that brings me to how I came to Alabama. My great-grandfather, grandfather, and dad are all preachers, and my dad took a church in Muscle Shoals, Alabama in December of 1991. And so I've grown up here for the last 30 years. I graduated Muscle Shoals High School in 2004, graduated from University of North Alabama in 2006. And if you do the math, it's true I graduated college with my four-year business management degree in less than two years, setting a record at the University of North Alabama in the process. Um, I'm a serial entrepreneur. Started my first company when I was 16 years old in my parents' screen porch. Operated that company for 20 years. Um, grew to almost 40 employees and nearly $9 million in revenue at one point. Sold the company one year ago. When I was 28, I started my second company, Gold Guns and Guitars, with locations in Florence and in Huntsville. And then last year, I started my third one called Fast Track Investments, which is basically a real estate company. All that to say, I make my money in the private sector. I'm not in politics for the paycheck. I'm in politics because I believe in the future of Alabama, and I'm scared for the future of America. When Barack Obama got elected president in 2009, I went from being a voter to being an activist because I couldn't just sit by idly anymore. I worked a number of political races from 2010 to 2018 as a volunteer campaign manager. And in 2018, I ran for office myself. I challenged a 28-year incumbent Democrat, one of the most liberal in the Alabama House. And long story short, I got 52% of the vote, first Republican to hold that seat since the Civil War, and I'm also rated the most conservative state legislator in Montgomery. Not my words, the words of four different scorecards who have looked at our voting record on both social and fiscal issues and ranked me number one. So uh, the first question will go to Stan, and then we'll alternate who goes first after this, but uh, Dr. Cook, given that there are members of the legislature that have argued to do away with the state auditor office and the limitations of the authority of the office, why do you want to be the state auditor, and is it a necessary office anymore? The state auditor's office uh, was an integral part of the founding of the state of Alabama in 1819. It was called the Comptroller's Office then. It oversaw many aspects of the state economy, uh, forestry, agriculture, uh, the railroads. Uh, over the course of years, Democrat governors and Democrat general assemblies and then legislatures uh, would peel away different responsibilities from the auditor's office to give it away as pet offices for their friends and created bureaucracies and agencies that we originally didn't have in 1819. Um, today, the state auditor is fighting for his life politically to keep the window of transparency open for the voter in Alabama so that the Amer Alabama citizen can look into state government to see how taxpayer dollars are being spent. I'll give you one example. Uh, the examiner's office has been pulled away. Uh, they get from two separate budgets a total of $16 million. Eight million of that comes from the general fund budget. Uh, there's another budget that gives them funding. The state auditor's office gets $870,000, $880,000. Next year there will be an increase. 
So you're looking at a bureaucracy that is a duplication in state government. That is one of the reasons why I'm running, to bring common sense back to state government and to bring our state auditor's office back to constitutional duties and responsibilities. And I offer that up to the voter. Andrew. Well, simply put, I'm running for state auditor because I'm trying to save the position. And we have a very weak state auditor in Alabama, and I don't mean the person in the office, I mean the office itself. It's very weak, and in 1939, as my opponent correctly noted, the legislature, Democrat-controlled legislature, stripped the auditor of the financial audits in Alabama. It was a mistake 80 years ago, and it's a mistake today, and now we can no longer simply blame the Democrats, because for the last 12 years, the Republicans have had majorities and supermajorities in Montgomery, and we have never returned to financial auditing duties to the state auditor's office. Now, in 2019, my first year in the legislature, there were two bills introduced in the state senate to eliminate the state auditor. And that's what first got me interested in the position. And I remember going and speaking with our current state auditor, Mr. Ziegler, and saying, what exactly is it that your position does? We've all been guilty of voting in the state auditor's race before and not fully understanding it. And he said, well, the state auditor tracks all the state's property. And he began to explain the position to me. And I was like, oh, so this is a government accountability position. He said, yes. And I said, well, we need to save it then. We need to do more than save it. We need to actually strengthen it. Now, the bills in 2019 didn't go anywhere, but a bill this year did. In fact, the bill passed the Senate with only one no vote, and I'm ashamed to say it was a Democrat who voted no, not a Republican. It came down to the State House, and it hit the House floor the last day of session. It was the third bill on the calendar. I had to go around to all the legislators and give them my 30-second elevator speech on why the state auditor was worth saving. Long story short, we did save the office. They were 17 votes short on passing that bill. And if that bill were to ever pass the legislature, there's still another opportunity, and that would be you, the voters. It would go on the ballot as a constitutional amendment. I encourage you, if you ever see eliminating the state auditor on the ballot, please vote no. That will send a big message to Montgomery that the voters are serious about having a government oversight position and keeping it and strengthening it. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we'll go back to you with the first question. This round. Uh, following along with that, would you lobby the state legislature to strengthen the office and how would you go about doing that? Well, I, I would. I, I've made it very clear this entire campaign that would be my number one goal as state auditor would be to try to strengthen the office. So the first thing I'd like to do if I get elected as state auditor is make sure the office is running well, make sure I understand all the all the duties that the auditor has right now, tracking the state property. I want to make sure we get the right people appointed to the board of registrars, which I'm sure we're going to talk about later. But then yes, every time the legislature is in session for those three and a half months every year, I will be working with my colleagues, my current colleagues in the legislature to strengthen the auditor's office. And how we fix it is very simple. In fact, I've already drafted the bill and I introduced the bill in 2021 legislative session. Now, unfortunately the bill did not pass. And I think what it's going to take is a public outcry. It's gonna take you reaching out to your legislator and telling them, we want a serious state auditor's office. How many of you think that we need to make Alabama more like Mississippi? Yeah, like nobody ever agrees with that, right? But in one area, we do need to make Alabama more like Mississippi, and that is our state auditor's office, because they have a serious state auditor over there. They have sworn investigators. They have arrest powers in their state auditor's office. Y'all, we have less than 10 employees in our state auditor's office. We don't even do the audits here. And every week, Shad White posts on Facebook. Shad, I've talked to him on the phone. Shad is the Mississippi state auditor. He catches people embezzling money and gets them arrested every single week and posts their mugshot and says what they did. Hey, caught so-and-so embezzling money from the underprivileged children's food fund or stealing money from the county commission or embezzling funds from, from this, that, or the other place. That's not happening in Alabama. So ask yourself, are all of our public officials in Alabama and public employees in Alabama good, honest, upstanding folks that would never, never skim any off the top for themselves? Or are we just not catching them all? And I'm gonna leave that as a rhetorical Well, and I do agree with Andrew that the main problem is the legislature passing the laws to restore the state auditor's position to what it used to be. But we also need investigative power, and we need to be able to be linked to the attorney general, not relying totally on the county sheriff or district attorney. But currently, in order to prosecute someone that steals state property, you have to rely on the county sheriff or district attorney and go that route uh, because the Attorney General is not going to do it. He's not required to do that. And the State Auditor's Office doesn't have the power to do that. It needs to have the power to do that. 
Um, I'm aware of a story that took place a few years ago where a state trooper um, purchased, or he had his tires replaced on his uh, patrol car, and he took the car home and uh, swapped the tires from his car to his personal car and put the old tires of his personal car onto the state trooper car. And he didn't think he would be caught. And he is the only person that I'm aware of in the state's history to be caught and prosecuted for stealing tires. But over a year, you'll have a million dollars worth of state property to go missing. And we need the strength in the state auditor's office to investigate and prosecute and then publicize what is going on. I agree that Mississippi sets a good example. West Virginia sets a better example. If you go to their state auditor's website, you will see a state auditor's position office that operated like Alabama State Auditor's position operated years ago. We need to go back to the future. We need to do it the right way. The voter in Alabama deserves better. The next question will come back if you stand for this one. Uh, the state auditor is a member of the State Board of Appointments for County Registrars. What will be your criteria for the registrars in each of the counties in Alabama? Well, the state auditor will get 66 appointments out of 67 counties. Jefferson County is the oddball, uh, and that we can discuss later. Uh, in 66 counties, we will have face-to-face -face interviews. We will look at resumes. We will look at, at experience that they currently have in the registrar's office. Uh, I have made a pledge to every county Republican Party, to the county leadership, that if a board of registrar member resigns or passes away, or for what, whatever reason is no longer holding that position, that I will meet with the Republican Party county membership and we will discuss their ideas, their opinions on who should be in that office, why they should be in that office. There is no way that I can know everybody in 66 counties. And I'm not gonna rely on the good old boy network of Montgomery to help me appoint those people. So we're going to go county by county and interview the people who are qualified for that job and then make a decision on their resume and qualifications. Thank you, uh, Andrew. Yes, I agree. That's a fantastic plan. We need to talk to people in the county to, to learn who, who should be put in these positions. But I want to ask them, are you serious about election integrity? Because the, the main role of the Board of Registrars is to register people to vote and more importantly, take people off the voter roll who, as our current Secretary of State says, either move away, pass away, or get put away, they need to come off the voter rolls. And that's where a lot of election fraud happens if there's people on the voter rolls that shouldn't be. If there's dead people on the voter rolls, people who moved away 20 years ago on the voter rolls, that's a recipe for fraud. Now, we've seen in states like Georgia how fraud in one big county like Fulton can turn the entire state. That doesn't need to happen in Alabama. And we are at risk of that because in Jefferson County, the state auditor does not get a board of registrar appointment. Neither does the governor or the Ag Commissioner. The County Commission picks their, their uh, Chief Registrar. Now the problem with that is right now, I think we have a three to two majority on the Jefferson County Commission, but if the Democrats ever win a third seat, the Democrats will be picking the Board of Registrar member in Jefferson County, which is 700,000 people. That's really scary to me. So I wanna make sure that the people I'm putting on Board of Registrars are serious about keeping the voter rolls clean, that they're, they're detail oriented because they have to get those, those the legislature draws the district lines, but the registrars use software make sure that the right voter gets the right ballot in a split precinct. Some of these precincts can have three ballots in them. That, that was apparent uh, how important it was in Etowah County. Um, a candidate there, his sister went and absentee voted and was handed a ballot that was incorrect. She said, well, no, I, I want to vote for my brother. And she said, my brother's not on the ballot. She was given the wrong ballot. So that just highlights, I think, the importance of the Board of Registrars. And I'll say this, I've not promised anyone an appointment to the Board of Registrars. I don't believe in that. No one who's currently on the Board of Registrars is guaranteed to be reappointed. I want to meet these people, I want to interview them personally and talk to them, and I do want to get input from the local Republican Party officials. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, the next question, you both talked a little bit about uh, the audit process and, and missing items. Uh, according to the state auditor website, in fiscal year 2021, items total value of more than $321,000 listed as missing or stolen. Given that, do you think there should be increased accountability on individual agencies regarding these items? Some of the blame may lie with the agencies, but the agencies
entities are correctly identifying that they're missing the property. And there are cases, I've spoken with Jim Ziegler, again, there are cases where we know what is missing, we know who took it, and it's still not getting prosecuted. Now, I'm not here to cast blame or to say anybody's not doing their job. I want to sit down and talk to local district attorneys and the attorney general. I know he's probably busy fighting Biden's vaccine mandate. There's many larger things going on the attorney general has to worry about, more so than just a $1,200 laptop missing. But people, as a business owner, I can tell you, if you have shoplifters in your store, you don't have to catch all of them. You just have to get enough of them and the word will spread. You need a couple police cars in the parking lot about once a week, and that ends your shoplifting problem right there. Now, 300,000 of missing property in one year, actually that sounds low to me. I've heard, I've heard figures closer to a million dollars of missing property. And we're missing very large items and very important items. Let me give you an example. How about a gun? Do I think it's a good idea for a gun to go missing? I guarantee you, whoever has that weapon, you don't want to have that weapon. People who can get a gun legally come to a store like mine and buy one. People who can't get a gun legally steal a gun. So anybody who has an illegal gun, you probably don't want owning that gun. We need to at least prosecute the gun thefts. So my goal as state auditor is going to be work with law enforcement officials because, again, the state auditor doesn't have the arrest power or the prosecutorial power. We're relying on other state departments and agencies to do this for us. But I want to sit down with them and I want to say, hey, can you work with me here? If we find some particularly egregious thefts, can we prosecute them and then let's publicize it and make an example of them so it doesn't happen again? Thank you, Dan. $300,000 missing or stolen. How many of you in the audience make $300,000 a year? Like $150,000 a year. You see, $1 stolen is $1 too many. And $1 that is stolen is a dollar that's not being accounted for. And we're not holding someone accountable, whether that's a bureaucracy, an agency, whoever it is. And you start looking at the math, you know, are those cell phones, is it a car? guns, laptops, tablets. There are things that we're putting in the ownership of the state that makes it very susceptible to be stolen. One of the things that I propose as the state auditor is that we go through every item that we purchase, line item by line item, department by department, and we identify those products that we can lease instead of purchase. Then the relationship becomes between the agency, the property manager of that agency, or the leader of that agency, and the company that the product is leased from. There's a different level of accountability, an added level of accountability. And we would save money by leasing these products. Once that leased product is stolen, not only is the state auditor looking at it, now you have a company, an outside company, that is looking at that product being stolen. So we'll get to the bottom of it, uh, who stole the property, but we will also have a different group of people helping us to prosecute those that steal that property. And we can save the taxpayer money by changing the way that we use that property. Thank you, Stan. Uh, we'll come back and stay with you, Stan, with the next question again along the same lines. Uh, we know that investigators have been put under the office of the Leah and the Attorney General, but since the auditor is also responsible for keeping track of equipment and property for those offices. Uh, do you believe the auditor's office needs its own investigators or investigative ability? Yes, you do, because now you have a conflict of interest. And uh, if you're auditing the very people uh, that you're relying on to help you to investigate and prosecute criminals, uh, that is a conflict. This is why we need to go back to the legislature. We need to set down, not just, and, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but not just present a bill and hope it makes it through. We need to craft legislation that solves all of these problems once and for all with one bill. And if we'll take our time, think it through, uh, look at every possibility of what can go wrong. And remember, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. There's also unintended consequences. So we need to think this legislation through. Uh, but that is definitely a conflict of interest. We need to avoid it. And that is why the state auditor's office has to be strengthened through the legislative process to give it investigative powers and a level of prosecutorial power to work with the sheriff, the DA, or the attorney general. Thank you, Stan. Andrew? The, the difficult thing about asking the legislature to pass a bill like the one that, we're, that we both agree needs to be passed is you're asking the legislature to give up some of its own power. 
It's kind of like asking the legislature to pass term limits. Now, hey, when I ran, I said I'd vote for term limits, and I said I'd introduce a bill, and I did. I introduced it my first year there. The committee chairman was a friend of mine, and he came up to me and said, Andrew, he said, I don't want to get your hopes up. I'm just going to tell you. He said, I was told to kill your bill at committee. Never bring it up. And I said, honestly, I kind of figured that was coming because that's just, you know, that's all the stories you've heard about how, about how that bill dies every year apparently are true. Same thing here. Right now, the Department of Examiners and Public Accounts reports to a legislative board. You're asking the legislature to give up some of their own power. It's a difficult ask, but you know what else was difficult was passing constitutional carry. And it took me four years, but I worked on it solid. I built the bill from seven co-sponsors to 38 co-sponsors this year. And my friend Shane Stringer was ultimately his version of the bill was the one that went through. We can do hard things, but what it takes is it takes you reaching out to your legislator and telling them, hey, why aren't you supporting the, the strengthening the auditor's position? You know, it got to where legislators would come to me and say, hey, man, I need to be on your bill next year. Can I co-sponsor? All my districts asking me why I didn't co-sponsor your bill. That's what we need to get to. Now, it's a double-edged sword trying to strengthen the auditor's office. If you say you don't want to strengthen it, people say, oh, Sorrell's running for a do-nothing office, just wants an easy government salary. And then if you say, I want to strengthen the auditor's office, they say, look at that guy trying to gather power unto himself. So you, you kind of get burned both ways. Here's my suggestion. Let's pass a bill to strengthen it, but have it take effect after the next election, whether that be two years later, three years later, one year later, whatever it is. That's fair for everybody. The question's also been asked, are you an accountant? No, nobody in the race is an accountant. What do you need to be an accountant for? We don't do any accounting or auditing in the auditor's office. That's the whole problem with it. I would be open to entertaining having a requirement that your state auditor be a CPA, but only if we strengthen the office to the point where that becomes necessary. Come back to you for this one along the lines of that. The state auditor's budget has decreased by approximately 25% since the current state auditor took office. What do you propose to do to help ensure that the state auditor's office has a healthy budget? And with rising gas prices, how do you expect they'll handle uh, the spending for this office in fiscal year 2023? Well, it is a problem. The, the state auditor's been under, underfunded, and we've had an outspoken conservative state auditor, and, and that has not been well pleasing to many in Montgomery. They have sliced the budget um, some years, um, you know, 10, 15 percent or more, and they've done it repeatedly. I fought against that. I thought it was wrong. I think I thought it was politically motivated. When I had never considered running for the legislature, uh, running for auditor myself, I was still helping to defeat um, that proposal to slice the auditor's office. Folks, they even took the state auditor's parking spot. That's how petty it gets in Montgomery sometimes. So we have to stand up for our state auditor. We've got to make sure that the position itself has the funding necessary. Now, what is that number? I don't know yet, but I'll tell you this, when I figure out, if I'm fortunate enough to be elected, when I figure out how much money the state auditor actually needs to operate and do a good job for the taxpayers in Alabama, that's the amount that we'll request for the budget and not a penny more. Now, if you've watched my voting record the last four years, you know that I sometimes will vote against budgets that grow government too fast. I will vote against big spending bills and borrowing bills. Why are we borrowing money? We have record-setting record, record setting budgets the last four years. Why are we borrowing so much money? So what I don't want people to say is Sorrell was against spending money until he became the auditor. Now he's requesting a budget increase. So remember this, it's already been cut 25% before me or Stan will be your next state auditor and takes office. So if we get an increase in the budget, that's not an increase at all. It's probably just replacing some of what the legislature, I think, unfairly took away. Thank you, Andrew. Stan, same question. Yeah, and, and a similar top answer, uh, and I'll say this with respect to Mr. Ziegler, uh, he has been mistreated. Uh, he has taken some stands that have been unpopular, and it cost him and it cost the office. Let's just tell the truth. That's that's the reason why we're running for office is to tell the truth. Um, and out of revenge, senators and House members voted to cut that budget, and that's the truth. Now, how do we go beyond that to make this office function like the Constitution requires? I propose, uh, after operating on a limited budget that we currently have, and we prove ourselves that we can do more with less, that then we sit down with the Senate leadership and the House leadership, and we say, look, ladies and gentlemen, we did not create this problem. The Democrats did. Why are we owning it? The Democrats pulled away the examiner's office from the auditor's office. They created an overbloated bureaucracy. Why did the Republicans want to own the Democrat problem that they created? So let's take the examiner's office, 
and pull it back under the state auditor's office. I will tell you today that if you take the top 10 salaries in the examiner's office and add them together, those people make more money than every constitutional officer that will be elected this November. That is a crime. That is a misuse of taxpayer dollars. So we can cut the top 10 salaries, bring that position over to the state auditor, and we don't have to worry about the budget. We don't even have to ask for a budget increase. Now we're reducing a new department with a limited budget and reduce, reduce that budget from the examiner's office. We can function better. Thank you, Stan. The next two, I've got an individual question, one for each of you a little bit, change the tone. Uh, Dr. Cook, Pastor Cook, uh, in your case, what's been the reaction of your church to you entering politics this way? And are you concerned that being a politician affects your ability as a pastor? No, not at all. Matter of fact, many of the members are here tonight. Um, and, you know, we want good government. Yes. And everybody says we want good government. But you got to have good people running for office to have good government. Government's not good or bad on its own. Government takes on the nature of the people that we elect. So if you want good government, you're going to have to vote for good people. Um, I don't expect it to impact the church in any negative way. And I don't expect the church to impact politics in a negative way. Matter of fact, we need to have a positive impact on the Alabama political landscape. And I think you do so by electing godly Christian men and women and put them in office. And I firmly believe that we'll see a positive influence if we do so. statewide you have the opportunity to serve more people i serve about fifty thousand people in house district three and as, I, as i've said before i have the most conservative voting record in the state house and but to serve five million people obviously is an opportunity a hundred times as large but really it's not about me at all it's really about saving the state auditor's office and i think the most effective way for me to do that is not as a single vote in the legislature it's just getting into the auditor's office and then fighting for the auditor's office and i'll say this in my opponent's defense i have no problem with preachers running for office i come from long line of preachers. We could do with some more preachers running for office in Alabama. I've never made an issue out of that in, in, in this campaign. Thank you. Okay, I want to ask a question uh, before we go to closing statements. The election is next Tuesday. On Wednesday, January 22nd, what's on your calendar? The first thing I'm going to do if I, if I don't win is I'm going to tell everybody to vote for Stan Cook for auditor because I believe we need a Republican position. And, and I don't mind saying that, and I, and I think Stan feels the same way. We, we both have similar goals for this position. This has never been about me versus Stan. This is about the state auditor, and I think both of us truly trying to do a good job with taxpayers in Alabama. If I do win, I, I plan to take Jim Ziegler out to lunch and learn everything about the state auditor that I can. Uh, if I win, uh, I will sit down with my wife and we'll plan out a strategy on how to enjoy the summer because this has been a year-long campaign. And uh, me and Andrew and Rusty Glover have been campaigning for this position for over a year. Um, it'll be a time of reflection. And then I'll be catching up on some duties that I need to do. Uh, we have a business deal in England that I need to get on the airplane and fly to Europe. So at some point we'll be working on that. Then we need to go to the Middle East and part of an archaeological dig. Uh, so uh, life goes on, and then we get ready for the state auditor's office, and I'm looking forward to that very much. Great. Now let's go ahead and go to closing statements. But since Stan got to go first in the beginning, I'd like you, Andrew, to you've got about let's see, we've got two minutes. Why should people vote for you? The last things you wanted to know, uh, as we are a week out from the election. One of the advantages of having served in the legislature for four years is that I have a record that I can point to. So a lot of politicians run from their record when they're campaigning. I can run on my record, and I encourage you to check my record out. I'm very solid on things like the Second Amendment and on social conservatism issues too, which I think sometimes get lost in the, in, in the fray and all the – we talk about fiscal issues so much. Social issues are important too, and I'm both a true social and fiscal conservative. I'm a family man. I met my wife on a bus in Italy. It was the – craziest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, she asked me if I like politics, so I got her phone number. We got back to the United States. We started dating. We'd known each other 34 days, and she asked me if it was okay if she went ahead and reserved the church for the next summer 
to uh, for us to get married. So that's the story of how I got married. Um, we have a little baby girl, and my wife and I love Liberty and Freedom so much that we named our daughter Liberty, and hope you've seen her in some of our TV commercials. And she loves campaigning with Daddy, but tonight this event started at her bedtime, so we didn't bring her tonight, so I hope you can understand that. But I encourage you to vote for me because I'm not just a conservative. Being a conservative is no longer good enough in Montgomery. Going to Montgomery and voting the right way or saying the right things is no longer good enough. We need people who are fighters, and that's what I've been for four years in the state legislature. And I promise you that's what I'll be if you elect me as your next state auditor. All right. Thank you. Stan? I'm asking for your vote next Tuesday to be your state auditor. What do I bring to the job? 20 years of experience being a warehouse manager, an inventory control manager, a property manager for Fisher Scientific, one of the leading scientific chemical companies in the United States, for immediate business systems, a company that built laptop computers with sand covers for our military overseas, and for medical laboratory associates, of which I created the alphanumeric inventory control system to track products from the point of purchase to warehousing to distribution to the departments. I have done the job. I will not have to learn on the job. There will be no learning curve for me when I step into the state auditor's office. For 20 years, I did that type of work. I know what it takes, and we will realign the state auditor's office to meet the needs of the people of Alabama, and we will redistribute the positions of employees not to be centrally located in Montgomery, but put an employee in Huntsville, in Birmingham, Montgomery, and in Mobile, and let them cover 16 counties or 17 counties apiece. And we'll no longer have to worry about office space in Montgomery because the people doing the work will be out in the field. And that is my plan. I'm ready to go. And again, I'm asking you for your vote. Great. Thank you so much for being here. Would y'all give him a big round of applause?